Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us America's leading cult expert Steve Hassan. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jeffrey, for having me on. Now, Steve, I'm glad to have you here to talk about Scientology. You are the author of Combating Cult Mind Control, which is the number one best-selling guide to protection, rescue, and recovery from destructive cults. And I don't know if people know it, but this was edited by John Atack. Right. I, I want to say that the book initially came out in 1988 and then in paperback in, in 1990. And in the original book, I had Hannah Whitfield's story in Chapter 5, and my publisher refused to publish the book with anything that we could be sued about with Scientology. So we like mentioned a word here and a word there, and Hannah's story got taken out. But after many decades of fighting with my publisher, I finally was able to buy the rights back. And we put out a new updated edition in 2015. And part of what's happened over the 40 years of my work is that um, a lot of people don't know about the cult that I was in, Jeff, uh, the Moonies or the Unification Church. Um, and yet there's been so much now of Lawrence Wright's going clear and Leah Remini's, etc. Uh, I asked John to help me edit it and to put in a lot on Scientology, if not in the text itself. I added his story uh, in the endnotes, which uh, so there's a lot of great stuff in there. We also added um, people born into cults that was not in the original book, and we added uh, terrorist cults and tr pimps and traffickers and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and a whole bunch of other groups and timely updates on the whole scene. Now, one thing I really like about your work, uh, you articulate a model called BITE. Could you tell listeners what the BITE model is briefly? Sure. So when I was uh, being deprogrammed back in 1976 following a f near fatal van crash, um, uh, the work that was used with me was Robert J. Lifton's Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, which was a study as an Air Force psychiatrist and military intelligence person of Chinese brainwashing techniques and tactics. And in his famous chapter 22, outlined eight criteria by which any environment may be judged as a thought reform or a brainwashing environment. And I love Dr. Lifton, he's my mentor. I've done several interviews with him on video that are on my website, but he's very ivory tower. The concepts are very you know, you need to read them and read them over again several times. And I wanted to develop a more simple, uh, easy to understand framework for how to evaluate whether a group is uh, healthy and constructive or unhealthy and unethical. And so the BITE model stands for, the B stands for behavior control, the I stands for information control, the T stands for thought control, and the E stands for emotional control. And I essentially took the three uh, major components of uh, psychologist Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance model, which was think thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and I added information. Um, so I give attribution where it, where it belongs to uh, Dr. Fessing Fessinger. But essentially, with this bite model, anyone can look at anybody's experience and outline it on a continuum of more healthy or less healthy, uh, more extreme undue influence and mind control and brainwashing or less. Uh, so, the, for example, be, you know, behavior control mechanisms include sleep manipulation or sleep deprivation manipulation of diet, change of clothing, change of name, uh, controlling where the person lives, who they associate with, making them ask permission for major life decisions. The, the orientation is to instill dependency and obedience. Um, and then that's you know just a few of the major parts of the behavior control. Information control, and this is a biggie. We were just chatting a minute ago about contracts. 
One of the biggest things about destructive cults is the lack of informed consent when people are being recruited into the group and giving them the illusion of choice and the illusion of control that they're joining of their own free will. But in fact, they're being lied to very systematically, whether they're being um, uh, critical information is being withheld or it's being distorted or outright lies. People are lured into uh, spending more time, energy, doing um, exercises, doing routines of processes, um, and they don't understand what the uh, ultimate agenda is or the ultimate belief system. In fact, they'll tell you they want you to be free when in fact the goal is to enslave you and traffic you. Uh, they say they want to help you develop your IQ and your and your intellectual powers when in fact they uh, constrict you and rob you of your ability to critically think and to do independent research. So the the information control starts when somebody is being lied to in their recruitment, but then once you're inside the group, um, people are taking whatever information you're giving them about yourself and they're recording it and using that information to design a uh, manipulation process on you. Um, and then they may interview family members and friends to gather information on you, again, to figure out what your buttons are, to figure out where to cave you in, to use a Scientology term. Um, and then they have people spying on each other and turning each other in with ethics reports, for example. Um, then there's an incredible amount of propaganda that's generated by a destructive cult. And anyone who's a critic or an ex-member is totally uh, diminished. And actual phobias, which is one of the emotional control techniques, is, is employed to literally make people afraid to think negative thoughts, to, to talk to their best friends or their family members. Um, and, you know, the way the brain works and the way the mind works is we need information. And if we are given too much information in a short period of time, we can't digest it and process it well. Or if we're given too little information or if we're given fake news stories and false information, it is very confusing. And indeed, in my studies of hypnosis, uh, confusion is the single fastest technique for inducing a trance. Uh, and now that I'm talking about hypnosis, Jeff, I want to mention that L. Ron Hubbard, or I should say Ron Hubbard, um, was a hypnotist. And in, there were many textbooks on hypnosis reportedly in his library. Um, and But he was telling members that, that they were being dehypnotized but it was basically a linguistic manipulation and lie. I can go through the rest of thought stopping and, and uh, the doctrine is black and white, all or nothing, we're gonna save the world, there's people who are with us and everyone else is, is, is either to be recruited or is against us. Um, there's um, uh, fear, guilt, uh, it's all designed to create a cult identity. See, what you've done is masterful. You've described Scientology in a nutshell. And what I'd like to do is is throw some things at you. Sure. And then, a and then you know, ask you to interpret them, you know, in terms of why Scientology is a cult. And the reason why I do it, the Church of Scientology reacts badly to being called a cult. Cults don't like to be called cults. Nevertheless, they're called cults for a reason. And what I've studied at the Scientology Money Project is how a person becomes a Scientologist, but I've, I've studied it from the legal perspective. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, there's an overlay that's very cultic, and I think what makes Scientology so hellish is that it, it's, it's a cult that uses legal contracts Mm. while it's using the techniques you're describing. So, the first thing Scientology does when it approaches what it's, and this is the dehumanization of Scientology I so deeply resent. 
a person who's not a Scientologist is called raw meat. Mm -hmm. They're a prospect. And this is where Hubbard used, you know, hardcore sales techniques. So the first technique Hubbard uses is to find a person's ruin mm -hmm. or their psychological. Okay, now, why does Scientology look for your ruin or psychological vulnerability? What are they wanting to do there? So I just want to first comment that the term raw meat um, is a objectification of a human being. It's the kind of thing that needs to happen if you're going to train a soldier to kill somebody else. You need to like make them not a human being. You need to make them an object. So that's, you know, that's part of the thing. But essentially, the, the system is designed to disorient, to confuse, to um, attack and assault a person's sense of self and sense of identity uh, in order to uh, program them with a new set of beliefs and a new language system, a new behavioral code, uh, in order to then make that new identity dependent and obedient on the group. Okay, so, so the first thing a Scientologist will do is they're going to objectify that person on the street as raw meat. And, and this, you know, this is part of clearing the planet as Scientology. Right, they're also wogs, right? People. Yes, they're <laughs> wogs. Well, you know, you know what's interesting? They, there's a lot of derogatory terms. Racist. Scientology. Yes, they're mm -hmm. absolutely. We're the Homo oriental gentlemen, so I believe what wog was the original. Term. Well, yeah, w w wogs, mm -hmm. uh, raw meat. But what's really derogatory is homo saps. Mm -hmm. Instead of homo sapien, homo saps. Because Scientologists are, of course, homo novus, the new man. Now, when they target a person, they're looking for their psychological vulnerability. What's interesting here legally, it, it, and I'm just put, adding in a layer to, to what you're doing. Mm-hmm. The first thing that Scientology makes a person do is watch a film called Orientation. Mm -hmm. And you've, it, you, you can Google it um, or look for it on YouTube. The church usually tries to get this taken down quickly. It's, and it's the one where the actor Larry Anderson, former member of the Church of Scientology, says you can either you know, choose Scientology or jump off a bridge or blow your brains out. A really creepy film. So by the way, that's what's called a double bind. You can either really? join the group and live or die. And that's one of Lifton's, what he called dispensing of existence, that it's, it's all or nothing. It's in or out. And you either have the right to exist or you have no right to exist. Oh, that's fascinating. And, okay, so you watch the film. Mm -hmm. now, now, when you watch the film, if you're interested, they ask you to sign a contract saying that you've seen the film orientation and that you agree that Scientology is a religion. Now, legally, you're giving your consent, which in American law, First Amendment protection for religion, you have to give your consent to be governed by the rules of the group. So this is the shadow thing that's going on, is they're using these cult techniques on you. They're also, the Church of Scientology is also legally stripping you of your civil rights, your right to sue. They're taking your legal power away from you. And they call it paperwork. Oh, just sign the paperwork. So just as uh, they can objectify or dehumanize a person, they can uh, lie to you about what you're signing. Okay, the second thing... But I want to just jump in and say, you know, Jeff, what's happening now is a... Um, such so many people are coming forward from the inner you know bellies of the group revealing all of the lies and the tricks and the falsehoods that brought you know were brought into play to get the religious status and um and anyone who really knows contract law if they are taught the actual hypnotic and mind control techniques that are being employed on people I think that the day is coming that all of these, uh, you know, signed documents will be um, just thrown aside in any court of law because they're not binding. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, unfortunately, right now, as you see in the Luis Garcia case, they are legally binding. 
because the court won't interfere with with religious activities, including the signing of contracts. So, not not to get too far off topic, but once you agree that Scientology is a religion, uh, the next contract you sign is that you agree never to sue the church. Now, in in terms of being a cult, they take that off the table. Where does that leave you legally and emotionally? I would argue, and I'm working on this very diligently, trying to understand the legal system and what what the, the issues are and how the law needs to be updated. And I would argue that you need to have freedom of mind in order to have freedom of religion. And if you don't have freedom of mind, if the locus of control for your life isn't within you, but it's with some manipulative person or group that's aiming to strip you down and manipulate you and get you to um, agree to a set of beliefs you don't even know exist yet, um, I would argue that the entire system is going to be thrown out. And so while right now the current environment may be to say, well, it's religion, so we don't want to go there. Um, I would, uh, I'm waiting for the right set of circumstances to argue what's really going on in the recruitment and indoctrination of Scientologists. And I agree with you because there is lack of informed consent when a person becomes a Scientologist. You're not told what's going to happen to you. You're not told what their psychomechanical processes are that are going to be used against you. Uh, and going back to the cult, the fundamental thing is is a shift in identity. And I know, I know that you use a dual identity model in mm -hmm. your work. Yep. That is where your, your natural identity or your native identity becomes replaced by the cult identity. Mm -hmm. And this is where Scientology is so devastating. It is so devastating. For new Scientology watchers, could you explain, and, you're, and you have a very succinct way of doing it, of describing how specifically Scientology replaces a person's natural identity with the Scientology identity? I've written books on the subject, and I have a lot of different videos as well. And, and I know Don Atec did a whole five-day program up in Toronto called Getting Clear, of which there are many former top leaders speaking. I did a whole thing on the... The TRs, when I've when I've demonstrated uh, uh, TR zero, closed my eyes, put my hands on my lap, etc., and just to be there uh, to uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and other experts who are in hypnosis, they say that's hypnosis, and I say yes, that's correct, and, and they and but they don't call it hypnosis, training trance. Uh, and then when I explain about the eyeballing, where you have to stare into the eyes of a Scientologist, they find that incredibly manipulative and disturbing. Why? Because when the eyes are created to move, not to stare, and when you stare, you go into an altered state of consciousness. And then if you're staring with mirror neurons in your brain next to someone who's already an indoctrinated person, you're you're unconsciously modeling you're taking in all of their behaviors unconsciously and then as the trs progress you're tr increasingly trained to be obedient in order to to pass in order to move to the next level as we're trained in our educational system to want to succeed and 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 go up um and what's happening is that people are being uh, rendered um, incapable of thinking for themselves and using their own um, reality testing mechanisms because of the system that's being employed deceptively on them. Okay, now let's go back for a minute. Now, for new listeners, uh, TRs are training routines. Scientology begins with training routines. This is the beginning of their processes and in one of the processes you make eye contact with another person you're setting knee to knee 
in a chair, right? Right. It's not just and, eye contact. You're staring into the other person's eyes, which is a very unnatural act unless you are, like, in love with somebody. It's, yes, but you do it for a long time. You it's do like, it for a, exactly, and and, and you're not, and you're not allowed to blink. And if you are doing um, hypnotic induction, it's called an eye fixation technique. So mm. if you're doing hypnosis, you could say pick a spot on the wall or look at that flame or look at your you know hand and keep focusing on your hand. It's a way of inducing an altered state of consciousness that renders you more suggestible to ideas and less critical thinking. And Steve, what's so interesting is even Scientology itself, and this is what Hubbard wrote, he called it upper level indoctrination. And when I first read that years ago, I thought, this is bizarre. They're telling you that they're indoctrinating you. Mm -hmm. And yet they don't like being called a cult. It's like, I'm sorry, but if you are actually indoctrinating people, upper level indoc, Hubbard shortens the word, uh, you are indoctrinating people very deliberately. So Jeff, I just want to break in and say that for me, I think that I make the distinction between cults and destructive cults. Like I think that there are a lot of people who are kind of really emphatically into something and like right now we won the Super Bowl in New England and there are all these culties who are loving the New England Patriots and they <laughs> didn't go to couldn't go to school and didn't go to work because they wanted to be in freezing snowy weather uh, to celebrate their team but they, they're doing that of their own choice they're doing it because they like to party and and they could use some good news um, they're not they're not in a destructive mind control cult where they're unable to uh, read what they want to read or talk to who they want to talk to or you know decide to leave the organization because they don't like it anymore. So the destructive cult piece is the huge thing. And I can tell you when you're saying, oh, Hubbard called it upper level indoctrination. Um, there was one point where Sun Myung Moon, the, the cult leader that I was uh, following, who was claimed to be the greatest man in human history, I might add, uh, said that he needed to brainwash us because our brains were dirty. And we were like, yes, we, we have dirty brains. We need to, we need to have our brains washed. Um, and so all of a sudden, the leader reframes reality and makes a joke or, or, or it, it just becomes okay. Uh, when in fact it's not okay. Um, and what what um, Scientology is about is really um, enslavement. It's the exact opposite of what it claims. John Atak piece, uh, The Total Freedom Trap, because he, in the shortest of little pamphlets, he outlines the trap. Yeah, and it is an outstanding piece. And I take your distinction between cults and, and destructive cults. Question for you. Scientology and, and other destructive cults all have an overarching cosmology. And, and you need that cosmology, don't you, in which to change a person's identity? Well, I would use story. You need some stories that people can buy into. So yes, but... The, the thing about Scientology that's so egregious compared to so many of the other destructive cults that I help people exit from and recover from is that you're even given a phobia that you're going to die of pneumonia if you hear about OT3 before you do all of the you know lower levels. But that's, the, that's what the real beliefs are, Xenu and the galactic dictatorship. Sure, and what's interesting, on it, the point I was making about cosmology, twofold. One, Scientology introduces you to a cosmology. At, at the lower levels of Scientology, you understand it to be, you become a pre-clear. You are the pre-clear. That is, you're not free of your reactive mind. You have Which engrams. is an invention. There's no such thing as a reactive mind. Yes, it is a construct. <laughs> the Moonies called it fallen nature, by the way. That's right and out of the Bible. All the other cults have different names for it to try to make it into 
the cult mind is good and the regular mind is bad. Yes, there's always a problem with the sin, <laughs> the sin nature, the fallen nature, the Adamic nature, the reactive mind. So there's always a problem mm -hmm. for which a solution is needed. And in order to attain this salvationary solution, you need to do the following things. The, the, within the cosmology, what, where I think Scientology, again, is very powerful and devastating, is they profoundly change your language. Mm -hmm. And w when you change a person's language, what does that do to their thinking and their identity? How does that work? Right. So, so uh, words are the tools we use to think. And um, if a cult succeeds in getting you to use their language instead of the real world language, it essentially functions as a constrictor. It, it, it narrows and constricts into a rigid ideological framework. Your brain and your mind and the way you filter experiences and what's so tricky and so sophisticated about Scientology is their dictionaries of words and what they call study tech, where they say, if you don't agree or you get confused or you spaced out, you, you passed over a word you didn't really understand. And so they get people to spend hours and hours and hours indoctrinating themselves into cult language system. And for me, meeting former members of the group, especially people who've been in for decades, even if they've been out for decades, if they're still using the language of the cult that they learn in the cult, in my opinion, they haven't done their healing homework yet. They need to reclaim the, the real words and stop using the cult words. Steve, what would you say? At which point does a person stop being their natural identity and start being a Scientologist, what are the indicators you would look for to say that person is a Scientologist? And I'm meaning as a member of a destructive cult. What's really interesting about Scientology versus a lot of other cults that I've worked with is there's no word for love. There's affinity, but True. the entire Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, it's about love, loving God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. It's about your heart and your love and your compassion and your ability to empathize, your ability to have conscience, your ability to step into someone else's shoes and look at reality from someone else's point of view. And for me, when a cult uh, takes that away, does de-emphasizes love, t t takes people away from their conscience, takes people away from their loved ones, takes people away from the things they love to do. Like I was a poetry writer and creative artist when I was recruited into the Moonies. I was asked to throw out my poetry. Why? Because it was part of my real self and they wanted it to cultivate the cult self. So yeah. they wanted to cut me off from my family and friends. They wanted me to stop playing basketball. They wanted, you know, they, I can, they cut off my ponytail and put me in a three-piece suit to, in, in order to install this, this uh, cloned identity that I thought the right way, felt things the right way, behaved the right way, and uh, beca basically behaved like a small sun, young moon. That's interesting. Now, when the um, cult identity collapses, that happens a lot of ways. What happened with you? How did your cult identity collapse? Was it gradual or sudden? So I was only in, Jeff, for two and a half years, and I was a rising star in the group. I was held up by Moon as the model member and the model leader. So I was fanatical. Uh, I did not want to leave. I did not have any conscious doubts whatsoever. I was doing thought stopping uh, whenever I had a doubt so fast that I wasn't even aware that I had it. Um, but that's different than someone who's been in for a long time, who's had a lot of disillusioning experiences. They've, they, they, they've, they've in, in Scientology terms, had a lot of wins, but then 
when when the spotlight wasn't on them, they knew that they didn't have all of the they didn't have perfect memory and they didn't have perfect health and and they really were still feeling pretty you know anxious or depressed or whatever um there's a lot of dissonance going on and when when somebody gets to uh the point where they're put in the hole and they're they're tortured or beaten or starved uh time after time after time they they often get to i don't care anymore if i'm going to hell or i'm going to go insane i can't take this anymore i remember mike rinder saying on the leah remini show um, at the point that they said that he couldn't interact with his family anymore, that was in Scientology, he said, then why do I need to even stay in anymore? If I can. Yeah, there, there is enormous cruelty in Scientology, particularly in the Sea Org, mm-hmm. which, which leads me to, to ask you, have you found ex-Scientologists, especially Sea Org members, to be damaged? Absolutely. I have, and, I have yet to meet any ex-Scientologist that isn't carrying around some fear, some phobia. In some cases, it's not a phobia because they're afraid of real harassment. But um, it's an incredibly traumatizing mind control cult. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, most people who leave it walk away or run away in the middle of the night. They don't want to talk about it. They kind of compartmentalize it in their mind, put it in a shelf, try to pretend to start over again. But the baggage is still in there. And I'm a big advocate for giving people tools and and frameworks for understanding mind control by teaching people about what it is and how it works in other cults, as well as deconstructing what the particular cult is that the person is in, um, and then, in a sense, reclaiming your power and your dignity. So, for example, one, t- one question I ask my clients, and I have people flying to see me in Boston from all over the world, because um, they're, they're sick and tired of walking around with all this baggage. So I do, I do uh, a very intensive uh, amount of work with them. But I'll ask them, you know, if you knew at the beginning what you know now, would you have ever gotten involved? Hmm. Like, remember when you first heard about it or or the first time someone approached you or the first time you saw the book? Go back in time to that moment. And if you knew then, hey, Jeffrey, here's what's really about Scientology. Would you have taken the next step? Would you have given them any information about you or given them any money? No. Right. Everyone says that in every, every mind control cult. Why? Because we don't want to be harmed. We don't want to be exploited and abused and lied to. So it's like reconnecting with the, 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 the self before it got recruited and indoctrinated and empowering us with a framework for understanding what is a mind control cult? How does it operate? How are they using manipulation and social psychology in this situation? And how do I say no? At the point that they tell you, don't tell your family that you're coming to the center, you look them in the eye and say, no, I love my family and I trust my family and you're a stranger. And anyone who's trying to tell me not to trust my family, I know is not healthy. I'm out of here. And see yourself and feel yourself walk out. And so by doing these types of revisualizations, re-experiencing um, a moment, you're compressing your cult identity into who you are now. If you've done your homework and you really have a good understanding of mind control and how it works, you can you can absorb the the cult identity into the you of today. Take the good stuff out. Like I learned how to public speak in the Moonies. I took that with me. I, I learned a lot of self discipline in the cult. I took that with me. A lot. Of, um, but leave the bad stuff. So it's really not an all or nothing at all. And I have a question that I've talked to more than a few Scientologists 
who believe there's such a thing as permanent cult damage. What would be your response to them to, if they say, look, I've been permanently damaged by a cult. There's no hope for me. I'll be screwed well, up. Well, I, I my hear life. that pretty regularly, actually, because um, so what I my orientation is to teach people how the mind works. And I, I'm orienting them to be in present time in their body, which is the opposite of what Scientology does. They want you to exteriorize, and they even hold it up as a positive thing. It's not. It's called dissociation, using hypnosis language. You want to be in your body, in the here and now, with the locus of control for your identity in you, with a positive future orientation. And anyone who says there's permanent damage, I would really want to evaluate their specifics. Uh, and I would say probably 90% uh, of the time, it's just a belief that's an error, that it's permanent. Well, because they feel perhaps so overwhelmed or they feel guilty for the amount of money they've spent or the, the family that they've broken up or the marriage, the children they don't see. Yeah, and yeah, but I believe that people are going to leave Scientology. They already are. When I was on Leah Remini's show, sitting a foot and a half away from Mike Rinder, as, as if those of you have seen that segment, I started crying. I was so surreal for me. This this forty six year you know member leader harasser of all of my friends uh, and me. Uh, is speaking out against Scientology and wanting to bring it down. And Leah, too. I'm like, this is wonderful. I live to this day. How wonderful. Steve, it was one of the most moving pieces of television I've ever seen when you were on the Leah Remini show talking to Mike Rinder. And from my own experience going back, I, I've been a critic for a long time mm -hmm. under the name Jay Swift. I was, you know, back in the... the early days of ARS, mm -hmm. Alt Religion Scientology. Oh, I remember. <laughs> and, and to me, when I would get Scientology publications, because I did some Scientology in the early 80s and I was on their mailing list forever, mm -hmm. when I would see Mike Rinder's photograph, it struck terror in me because he was in charge of OSA and he, OSA was the department that could destroy your life. Yes, it struck so terror in me too. <laughs> I was only in SP since 76, but but I saw what they did to my friend Paulette Cooper and so many other friends. So it, when was, I saw it was surreal to sit next to a man and, and Leah, but it was he. And that's why I was like, this is amazing. This is so great. Oh, it was incredible. When I heard that Mike Rinder had left, uh, it, it shifted my paradigm about what's possible for Scientologists because of Mike Rinder. Exactly. Could, could leave. Anyone could leave and walk away. And what's interesting, this is another legal element I want to go back mm -hmm. to. So I want to just uh, highlight for Jeff, anyone who says there's permanent damage and there's nothing that can be done and they're hopeless, it's just not true. They just haven't so gotten so access to the right set of resources and done their healing work. And it's a belief, and it's something Scientology as a cult wants you to believe. Yeah. The, the only the only way Hubbard used to say the only the only way out is through, meaning you have to go through the whole damn thing. You don't have to. Of course you not. Know, Nor do you have to route out either. That's a f f phony manipulation device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leave, leave the proper way, huh. which means. Which means don't leave. Right. You know what's ha you know what's happened, Steve. And this is an interesting again. This is where cults, and I'm just going to say the Mormon Church LDS is using contract law. They have a back channel relationship with Scientology. They and the Moonies, by the way. Oh, it's 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 this unholy alliance, and which is why I think the current structure of religious tax exemptions should end. Because when you can have an unholy fusion of American business contract law with First Amendment religious protections, anyone in that kind of group is screwed. You have no rights. You are screwed legally, emotionally, physically, in every way. Mm -hmm. Agreed. The, 
the way out is to specifically withdraw your consent in writing. That's the legal way out is to say, I state your name, specifically withdraw my legal consent to be governed by your ecclesiastical rules and discipline. I am no longer a member. That's the legal way to do it. You work on the spiritual, emotional aspects of it. And so, so when Mike left, I was blown away. <clears throat> I was really moved when you, you and he were speaking on Leah's show. And I think Leah is so very brave. She's such a warrior. Absolutely. Doing what she's doing. The effect of seeing week after week after week for the people who are leading Scientology, specifically David Miscavige, a show like Leah, what effect does that have on a cult leader? What happens to the cult leader? Does he double down his bed and become more cruel? Or what do cult leaders do under this kind of withering exposure? Well, I actually asked um, Mike and others whether they thought that um, David Miscavige was watching the show. He said absolutely he thought he would be. Um, and if that's the case, not that I've been asked by Mike or Leah, because I haven't, but I would recommend a completely different strategy than season one, if they get to do season two, which I'm hoping they will. Because if, if David Miscavige is watching the show, then we need to apply the Freedom of Mind strategy book, which is when you're trying to help somebody... Uh, reform or wake up or change, the last thing that's going to be effective is a frontal attack on them personally. That's mm -hmm. going to make them get more entrenched. It's going to um, reinforce the darkest side of them. Um, and what, you, what I think... I added by being in that special was talking about the Moonies and talking about other cults and talking about mind control. I talked about hypnosis, but that got cut, unfortunately, due to lack of time, I guess. But educating about the bigger phenomenon first and then asking things in sets of questions as opposed to like trying to, you know, uh, do a frontal assault. So asking a thoughtful question, giving a, a, a long pause, and I think when I saw um, Ron Miscavige, David's father, and I know that you just interviewed him. I haven't yet listened to your podcast with him, but I saw his uh, interview with Leah, and I saw him on other shows when he was promoting his book. When I saw him say, I would still forgive my son because he's my kid. It just touched me, and I know that it must touch David's authentic self that was there prior to him getting into the cult. I believe that that part of his psyche still exists. So the question is how, how to tap in and empower that side. So By the way, I would love to talk with David Miscavige if he's listening to this. We can do it completely confidentially. Nobody need know. Likewise, I, I would uh, very much like to interview David Miscavige. And I don't put that outside the realm of possibility of interviewing him someday or even Tommy Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, people like that. W what I did want to add that something that the church is doing legally, there are several high-ranking members who have left the Church of Scientology, but they've gotten paid off. They've signed non-disclosure. Yeah, gag, roll, uh, gag deals, which is... Well, you know. Now, from, from my perspective as a corporate guy, that's a sign of fear. The church is terrified because when you start paying hush money, and that's what it is, it's hush money. Mm -hmm. You, you I can agree. do all the BS you want, but it is hush money. When corporations, and Scientology is very much a corporation, start paying hush money, that's a sign of weakness and fear. Yeah, and absolutely. There's no question. When when I listened to Ray Jeffrey on the Leah show talking about how Debbie was on the stand telling her story, they realized, oh my goodness, we can't have this. This is an open court. <laughs> quick, settle, quick. Yeah, quick. They, they, they took out their checkbook after one day and said, how much? Yeah. And, and so Scientology's 
is falling apart. I agree. You, you as a call expert, what do you see as you know the next twelve to sixteen months for Scientology? Do you see it more people leaving? Do you see more people looking to recover from their Scientology experience? I mean, what what happens in, as you, when within your understanding of the cults? Let me ask you, what's going on in Scientology now? What do you think is going on inside of Scientology now? What do you think the future of the movement is? So I really would like to know what's happening with Shelley Miscavige. And um, if, if she was approached in the way she should be approached, which isn't, you know, showing up and saying, hi, do you want to be here? Oh, you do? Okay, bye. No, it's taking her into the police station in a safe spot where there's no one else <laughs> around that uh, is, is in the group and where the, where the police have been properly prepped and understand undue influence and mind control and how to do motivational interviewing. And once I think she has, has uh, so much knowledge about what's really going on inside. So the legal system needs to change and be updated to what we know about my, how the mind works now, all the neuropsychological advances that we have. Um, the current administration, I'm not sure that, that this next four years is going to be a favorable environment for advancing the, the law, but I can tell you um, things like ISIS, which is a mind control cult, um, things like trafficking, which involves 21 to 27 million people internationally, there's real will and, and interest and resources figuring out how to stop people from getting recruited into terrorist cults and how to rehabilitate them if they leave. And the same thing with trafficking victims. So with that angle, I think the clock is ticking for the planet to come to a higher understanding about how the mind works. And as I was saying earlier in this interview, I think people need to get to a place where they realize that you can't have freedom of religion if you don't have freedom of mind. That's very well said. And, and so much of bad religion has to do with indoctrination, hatred aggression, hostility. Mm -hmm, exactly. So you, in order to have freedom of mind, you need to have the ability to have an integrated um, approach to critical thinking, intuition, emotion, heart, behavior. And freedom to join means also freedom to leave. And any group that says it's not okay to leave is automatically in the dark category. Or any group that says you can't talk to or read anything by ex-members or critics, that's called censorship. That also demonstrates lack of freedom of mind. Because if you're free... You should be able to read whatever you want and make up your own decision about it, not have someone else tell you what's okay to read and what's not okay to read. Steve, I'm glad you made that point because censorship is intrinsic to Scientology. That is, don't speak, don't talk, don't think. And when I grew up as a, as a um, in the Christian church, I've talked about my experience you know, at length through my interviews. Christian apologetics had the viewpoint that the faith had to be able to stand on its own two feet out there in the secular world, mm -hmm. and you had to know that you had to know, you know, science and contemporary thought, uh, politics. So you were very in engaged at, at that level. You mm -hmm. have to be in the re you have to be in the real world. Yes. I I always respected that when I was a Christian because if my faith couldn't stand on its own two feet it really wasn't faith. And to be intellectually honest 
to my own true character, I had to leave the Christian church because it was no longer appropriate for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we grow as human beings. We evolve, and we need to have yeah. that freedom. Sure, and I, I, I left of my own free will, and I was uh, in the Assemblies of God. Now, I got to walk away. When I left, my, my pastor said, well, I'll pray for you. But, you know, nobody hounded me down. I wasn't chased, fair game, no character assassination. And that made a strong impression on me that I had the freedom to walk away and, and, and go in. And I began to study Eastern religions, you know, Buddhism, and mm-hmm. Vedanta. And that made a strong impression on me that I had such incredible freedom to, to reinvent myself. Mm-hmm. So coming out of a very authoritarian tradition, faith tradition of Pentecostalism, I nevertheless had the freedom to reinvent myself. And when I knew that I could, I had my my own freedom, that it belonged to me, it didn't belong to a god or a book or a group or an mm-hmm. institution, mm-hmm. It, was a, it was a profound insight. Now, did it end the human struggle? No, because I still st- struggled, you know, for authenticity, identity, I still had conflicts I work with. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the Scientologists need to understand freedom is not in the Church of Scientology. They don't own it. And, and, and I'll just give you, end on a metaphysical note. Mm-hmm. I, um, this concept of eternity, I had a realization that there's no group or divine person or book that owns or controls eternity. And and that was important for me when I was young. I was realizing that eternity, whatever it is altogether, even if it's just this lifetime, is mine to control. Mm-hmm. That is, I am self-determined, and it's not a book, a messenger, or a divine person. Right, the and locus of control is inside you. Yes, thank you. That's it, it, it was returned to me, and and it gives you a certain amount of responsibility and struggle, and you, suddenly you're not saved anymore. And what was interesting, to no longer think of myself as being saved, uh, you're out in the world. Saved, by the way, is a loaded term from my point of view, being Jewish. Because I don't, you know, I believe Jesus was a Jew and was a teacher. But, you know, I feel just fine with my spirituality. I don't feel like I need to be saved. Oh, I take your point exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I I discovered that salvation was a construct. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus, of course, was very much Jewish. So this construct of salvation presupposes a problem that very often is itself a construct. You know, the the idea of the fallen nature? Yeah. That Adam and, and Adam and Eve sinned and there was a fallen nature. I thought... Well, that was a story, and I was living in a story, and I was in that language, mm-hmm. and I no longer identify with that story, and I was free to simply be human. And, Steve, what's so very perverse is you'll hear Scientologists in the church say, I'm more myself than I've ever been, and it's it's incredible for them to say that when who they're having to be is a member in good standing of the Church of Scientology, an IES member, a Cornerstone member, a Platinum Meritorious, <laughs> a Clear, a Pre-Clear. <laughs> right, but I mean, seriously, if I if I was sitting with a Scientologist and they said things like that, I would be asking them a lot of very thoughtful questions that would cause them to step in out of that mentality and actually need to do some new investigation to figure out the answer to that rather than just give a canned answer. Well, Steve, do you have just a minute for our small role play? Sure. sure. And then i okay, got to go pick up my kid from gymnastics practice. I understand. Scientologist says to you, I'm more myself than I've ever been. What do you say? So I'm curious, Jeff, how long have you felt that way? Since I completed OT8. 
Uh huh. So, how did you feel just before you completed OT8? I felt curious about what there what there was up at the top of the bridge for me, mm. and how I finally would get the answer. Uh huh. And how did you feel about before you did eight OT7? I felt like I needed to get onto solo on the level so I could handle the real issue. Oh. And I can't talk to you about it because I've signed a hundred thousand dollar bond. I can't talk about the OT levels beyond that. It's okay. You don't need to tell me, but the important thing is you think about it within yourself. Because I heard you when you said that you feel like you're more yourself, but as you were saying it, it kind of sounded like it was some words. It didn't really touch me in my core the way it would if it was really true. Okay, Steve, that was that was beautifully expressed. It's simply questions that people can ask themselves, and and often well, and we I'm, I'm, I, I mean, you could go back in time before they met Scientology. You could get them to go forward. Imagine they had done OT10. <laughs> It hasn't been released yet. But the the point is, is then I go back to, tell me, do you like animals? Oh, I love dogs. Well, tell me your favorite dog. Oh, my dog, Corky. Oh, when was the last time you were with Corky and just f had such an incredibly wonderful time with Corky? Oh, it was in 1983 and I was under this tree and I'm like, and when you were with Corky, just having this amazing time. Didn't you feel like you were most you? And, and that would be a moment they could go back to. S Steve, we have to uh, have another interview and continue this. Or, or a series. <laughs> sure. because, <laughs> and because I, by the way, I offered David Miscavige, if, if Tom Cruise or John Travolta or other people would really like to have a confidential private meeting to pick my brain to learn about cults and mind control. My website's freedomofmind.com. I'm really busy, but we'll fit you in. We'll find a time. Well, I hope to make time, and likewise, if any Scientologist wants to come on Surviving Scientology Radio to make a defense of Scientology, I welcome them. My microphone is always open. Karen Powell can come on. David Miscavige, anyone who wants to. But it's been a pleasure talking to you, and the time went by way too fast. I look forward to talking to you again because I want to get into the nature of religious experience, cultic experience, and there's so many other things. Uh, Steve, we enjoyed having you today. It's a pleasure, again, Jeff. Be well. Again, thank you for your good work and for helping others. It's a wonderful thing. Well, likewise. Thank you. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this has been your host, Jeffrey Augustine. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.